So the big question is this, how do real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base? How do we conservatively grow our real estate business to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race, and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. Greetings and salutations, real estate undergrounders. This is uh, Ed Matthews with the Real Estate Underground podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, So today... I get to introduce you to literally my favorite data scientist on the on the face of the planet. He is a multifamily investor, both on the active side as a GP, uh, as a KP, and uh, I believe he has several hundred units uh, in his back pocket as an LP as well. So, uh, Dr. George Roberts, and I'll only call you Dr. once. Um, welcome to the show, and uh, good to see you, my friend. How are you? It's great to see you, Ed, and thank you for having me on the show. It's a great honor. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I am notorious for stalking, right? Whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, and uh, it's how I find, you know, really smart people to have conversations like this one about. And so, I, I, I actually, gosh, it's got to be a couple of years now. Um, uh, was introduced to you through, I want to say, Yona Weiss's. Uh, LinkedIn channel, oh, yes. right? Um, and mm-hmm. uh, so, Yona, if you're out there, thank you very much. Um, the uh, and and then uh, you know had the opportunity to join your uh, weekly uh, networking group, which is amazing. And uh, you know the amount of talent and brain power on that on that uh, Zoom call every week is mind blowing. And uh, you know you should charge for it because I certainly learn something every time I'm I'm uh, I'm on that you know on that call. So thank you. Um, so yeah, thank George, welcome to the show. And uh, we're going to get into all that. We're going to unpack everything. Your podcast, your meetups. Uh, I I understand there's a potentially a book coming up, although we can't talk about that and that's cool, but I'm going to make you come back and we're going to talk about that when you're ready. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, um, George, welcome. And uh, it's good to see you. Um, yeah. Great to see you. Yeah. So, so George, for, for those folks who haven't discovered you uh, yet, and it's, I assume it's only a matter of time, the, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and, and uh, then we'll get into it. So I'm really just a tech guy who discovered the fire of entrepreneurship. I worked as a bioscientist, became an award-winning data scientist in fintech. And then one day my sister said, hey, let's launch a company. Why don't we start doing ground up construction, right? And we're just talking a couple of days back. She said, you know, hey, there are a lot of fourth or fifth generation builders in this business. There aren't a whole lot of first generation builders. Right. And, you know, she's absolutely right. Uh, we picked one of the hardest businesses to break into. And I just had a blast doing it. And I realized there's more to life. There's more life than being a tech guy. And I realized not only do I have a talent for entrepreneurship, not only does it light my fire, but also I could repurpose a lot of what I had done. So I had learned to become a great uh, data analyst, data scientist, and had at that point realized, well, look, I don't think there's enough housing economics out there explained from the standpoint of the multifamily investor, for example, a lot of single family stuff out there. But if you're really trying to get in this and you want to be successful in the business, whether you are a passive investor or an active investor, I thought, you know, I could really fill a niche. And that really helped to provide the impetus for me rebranding as the data scientist of real estate. And that's what I'm here to do. Help people understand what's going on so you can invest with confidence. So so it's interesting. You know, obviously you are a person of high on high intellect and capability. Why real estate? I mean, you could do anything. Right. So why'd you pick real estate? Great question. So as a data scientist, I feel like part of my job is just to survey the world and make sure that I'm in the right place. Am I in the right occupation? Am I investing in the right asset class? Mm -hmm. And that survey led me directly to multifamily real estate. I jokingly call it the gateway drug to commercial real estate. But let's be clear, it is more stable. It's not like buying a single tenant industrial. Right. <laughs> Multifamily is a lot more buffer than that. And I think it provides a great opportunity. And it provides particularly a great opportunity for people who enjoy people. You're going to need a network more. Right. 
right. to succeed in this business. And also people who enjoy numbers. If you like the finance side of things, or if you can find somebody on your team who does, then I think you've potentially got a bright future with multifamily. Because again, I think you're really merging. You're sort of sitting at the nexus of finance and commercial real estate. Yeah. And I would add marketing to that as well, right? It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an industry that uh, enables, you know, also, you know, I am a former tech, I guess, recovering technology uh, person. And, uh, you know, it, it, it allows, you know, folks like you and me and other people out there to uh, utilize the skills that they created in corporate world uh, to, uh, you know, and, and directly apply to the success of a particular project and investors and, uh, and your own company, right? I know where you're coming from. I call myself a recovering PhD. Yeah. There you go. So, so Horizon was trying to make good. Yeah, that's all right. You know, just incremental improvement over the over time, right? Baby stuffs. Uh, yeah. So, so tell me about tell us about uh, Horizon Multifamily and and uh, where that fits in the marketplace and what your focus is. Sure. So we started out a few years back. Met at Dealmaker Live. I was actually the last to join. I met one of our partners locally, and it's it's a perfect example of just how. You can get started in this business, get get yep. together with some people, start underwriting deals. And next thing you know, then you're running deals. And that was our evolution. So over the last few years, we've uh, we've gone from analyzing 100 deals to being apartment owners, now in about five deals. And, and my focus particularly, I like the sort of middle attitudes of the country, this upper south, lower north, this area that's it's, it's nice enough, it's warm enough for people to want to move there, but yeah. it just hasn't gotten quite as built up as, say, Texas or Florida right. or Arizona. I mean, there's some areas that are already starting to, you know, sort of figurative feel the heat. Right. And these areas that have experienced these super hot markets, I like to say, you know, there's there's something to that. I mean, like some of them I think are a little too hot to touch. Yeah. And I can't, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. And you could see that these hot markets may go on for, you know, one, two, three, or five more years. But I certainly feel a lot more comfortable in a place like, say, East Tennessee, where I can see that it's beautiful. Right. People love the Smoky Mountains. They love to work from home or away from home these days, right. uh, as you can do, working remotely. And places Places like that are really drawing people in. Kentucky is also amazing. Uh, I mentioned East Tennessee, Kentucky. These are areas that are not terribly rent constrained. A lot of people are way under 30% of their monthly income in these areas. These are areas that have room to run. What's the part of the country right now that's growing the fastest in terms of rents? It's the Midwest. So you got to remember, whatever whatever was hot yesterday is not necessarily what's going to be hot tomorrow. And when you get towards the end of the cycle, as it appears we're at right now, what was hot yesterday may be precisely what you don't want to be in tomorrow. You mean there's economic cycles and things change? Yeah, thank you. You know, I love it. Two tech guys. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 maybe this is a little obvious to us, but I think a lot of people, if you're, if you're listening to a guru talking on YouTube from a year ago, I, I got news for you. There, there may be an expiration date on that advice. Yeah. And look behind you. It, it was, it was, a, it was a little bit back. It wasn't, it's not today or tomorrow. Right. So, so as far as, um, you know, I'm interested in, and you and I haven't talked about this in a little bit, but, uh, I, I'm curious about your perspective on the market in terms of, so you and I tend to chase, I don't think we chase the same deals. I think you, you're, you're operating in much larger complexes than I do, than I focus on. But, but I've, I've, I've fallen in love with Kentucky myself. And I was actually just down in Tennessee, uh, last, uh, gosh, when was that last September? And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I, uh, I was marveling at the amount of built to rent and, uh, as well as, uh, you know, sh uh, short-term rentals, but not a ton of multifamily activity, at least not that I saw. I mean, Memphis has always been a great, you know, uh, cash flow market, but, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunity, you know, there's lots of opportunity everywhere, but, but in that, in that slice of the world, it seems to sure. be, there's uh you know, that it's loosening up a little faster than say where I live in Connecticut, which is, you know, everybody's high-fiving when they close a deal at a four cap and I'm just cringing uh, and praying for their uh, successful refinance when the bridge loan comes due. But uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, in terms of your perspective on the market, you know, I mean, some people say we're in a recession. Some people say, you know, winter is coming, you know, I'm, I'm, 
curious about your perspective and uh, what you're seeing in your mar- in your markets in terms of rent growth or you know lack thereof, uh, as well as uh, you know cap rates, whether they're compressing, expanding, whatever. Well, in my markets, I think we're seeing a lot of leveling. I mean, East Tennessee, it seems, is just going like crazy. I mean, there's a lot of you got to remember a lot of these places. Even when you see the new leases stop going up, okay, let's say you literally hit a wall and asymptote. Well, you still got a lot of loss to lease because your renewals have time to catch up. Right. You'll you'll increase them a little bit when you renew and when they move out, perhaps increase even a little bit more. So some of those markets, uh, I think you were making a little bit of a joke about forecasting in the rear view mirror earlier. Uh, there can still be a little bit of life left there, even as you uh, do level out. So I think I'm seeing a lot of that in my markets. I know Orlando is still growing, although it, it depends exactly precisely where you are. I mean, we've captured such incredible rent increases yeah. that right now we're quite happy just to stay where we're at. If we can keep our place leased up, Orlando, we're we're happy because you yeah. know we're we're doing fine. We did not buy at the top of the market. Uh, we bought quite quite a while back, and uh, so I, I, I guess that's the first thing I would say is make sure that whatever you're looking at, whatever metrics you're looking at, make sure you're making a differentiation between new leases versus releases. Absolutely. And uh, and then as as far as uh, other markets, yeah, I mean we we are still continuing to see rent increases. I would say in most of the markets of the U.S. And a statistic I just checked out earlier today, trying to find the citation, uh, if I can, it's $1,000 is the premium between owning and renting. Okay, So it is very, very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been like that for a few months. We've gone a little higher and we've sort of leveled off $1,000. I mean, that is just insane. Hard to see how we have a whole lot of new homeowners when you have that sort of... And premium, of course, is calculated between what is your mortgage payment versus what is your rent payment. Now, people are not bad backing out of that, how much equity you're getting in the home each month through amortization. Sure. But the point of the matter is, is that that sort of wondering where we're going to be, you know, down the road five or seven years when you cash out of that mortgage. Right. That's, yeah. And, you know, that's I mean, a luxury only if you're making your bills. Uh, correct. And, you know, there, I, I've seen study after study that says that, you know, the average American has what, $400 in a, in a rainy day fund uh, on average, which is uh, terrifying. Um, but the, uh, the, you know, so it's interesting, like here in, here in the Northeast, uh, the last, I'd say two and a half, three years, uh, you know, rents have, have exploded and they're still growing. Uh, but they're, you know, like you were saying, they've kind of stabilized They're they, they're, they're not growing anywhere near as fast as they were. You know, it seems to be that they're com- kind of reverting back to, you know, the, the historical norms, you know, the three, 4% year over year, which I think is healthy. Right. And, uh, you know, cause the fact is that at least here in, in, in our market, you know, what's driving rent is, is uh, supply and you know 08 09 2010 11 wiped out the the general contractor class here in this area that was building um, multifamily so there's been a 10 12 year gap of no multifamily construction and you know turns out human beings uh continue to have make babies and they continue to need housing and you know here in Connecticut I think we're 26,000 units behind where we need to be for the 2030 projection, which is a lot for a small state. Yeah, that's huge. And like I mentioned, those are in many cases, the fourth and fifth generation builders. They were out. It takes a long time for them to come back in or for new players to come back in. And another thing about Connecticut and the Northeast is that I understand you're also kind of built up and uh, that makes it harder to build new car washes. So true that's, that's yeah, another that's play definitely. out there. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The people who are buying these car washes in the rest of the country, I don't know. But if you're buying out there in the Northeast where it's really hard to find find uh land bat stuff that's that's good so anyway i guess we can yeah. talk about car wash bubble another day yeah that we'll save that for a different show but i was always fascinated by that business model but the uh you know in terms of the you know the appreciation and you know what is your philosophy when you're going to buy uh you know i know you you're you're an expert in in repositioning right i mean that's kind of your wheel one of your wheelhouses right and so you know when you're looking at a property you know what are you particularly focused on what are you looking at in terms of the financials and you know, the, the, the area, uh, demographics and, you know, growth numbers and all that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd love to give you a citation on that last thing I mentioned about the thousand dollar gap. We That's John in... Burns. Oh, okay. From the show notes. So I love to see a lot of loss to lease. I love these mom and pop deals. So I know you also off operate in the smaller space. I think small number of units can be great. You can have a lot of meat on the bone. And and when we say these are small deals, if you got 10 or 20 or 30 units, that is a big deal. It's a, That's for me, way it's bigger. Enormous, right? Incredibly big. Right. And it's, it's, it's way bigger 
better than, you know, hey, a single family fo- home uh, burr or a uh, you know, fix and flip. So yeah, these small to medium deals can be huge. And a lot of times, particularly if you get them out in a tertiary market, you can have people who haven't optimized the property. I'm looking at one right now and there's literally no advertising, not even free stuff like Google, no Yelp, none of that. You can even put up a very cheap website and that's not being done either. And sure, yeah, I think it gets out on Zillow when there's, but it's really just word of mouth. So I look for these sorts of things. Properties was a huge loss to lease where, you know, you might, you might look for some deferred maintenance or you might even find an operations place, somebody who's been running it okay, but they're just not running it like they should because who knows, maybe they have the brother-in-law on the payroll and things are costing a lot more than they should, or they don't keep the occupancy like you know that the other properties in the area are looking. And I think that's the huge thing now. We might be towards the end of a cycle or we might be just taking off again. If rates go down, I say we're in mid-cycle. As you mentioned, we're way underbuilt. So it's entirely possible that we plateau for a little while. I mean, actually, we're already up. Uh, As we record this in the middle of June, uh, January was the lowest point in the median sales price of homes sold in the US. And we've been coming back up sharply since then. Yeah, there's no inventory. Yeah. I mean, it's there's zero, right? I, I was uh I have a property in East Hartford, Connecticut, which is a you know secondary city in the in, in here. And uh the realtor who the agent who is trying to talk me into selling that property uh sent me an email the other day that said uh there is actually just one duplex for sale in the city of Hartford, East Hartford. And uh you know you should really think about selling it's a four family and uh you should really think about selling because I was thinking you know I was looking at it in terms of trading up you know taking the win because I've owned it forever taking the win and then trading up to a much larger building and I, I haven't decided yet um because it's my baby it's on Clark Street in East Hartford which is which is I named my company after so it's literally the first building I ever bought but uh but yeah I mean you're you're a hundred percent right there's there's just not a lot of inventory and and so you know when you go to reposition a building obviously you know there's the economic piece where, you know, we look at rent upside, we look at, uh, you know, reducing the cost envelope of the building. But, you know, are you, do you, where does appreciation and value kind of figure into your, your thinking? Are you, uh, you know, a cash flow guy, an appreciation guy, uh, a little bit of both? I think it's fair that we should all be a little bit of both, but I would lean toward the cash flow. It's a lot safer. And again, I think that safety is what people need to focus on right now. Even though I do expect that prices will continue to rise, we are in volatile situation right now. And if the economy takes a major tumble, the four rates come down. And remember, it takes time to refinance. And you could find yourself with a building full of tenants that are out of a job and not being able to service your mortgage. So you definitely want to have reserves and you definitely want to have cash flow. So I would say I would always prefer cash flow, but yeah, there has never been a better time to have reserves on the sidelines. Yeah. it's uh, it's so, So when you look at reserves, you know, how do you judge you have enough? I mean, is it is it by the operating month? Is it you know what is the metric you use to determine what your your reserves should look like? Sure. Well, one rule of thumb is that you want want to have at least three months of operating expenses. And- as operating capital. That's a great start. If you can have six months of principal interest stocked away, that's even better. Now, are you putting away $250 per unit per year for replacement reserve? That's if things are are going well. What if you've got to replace your roof in five years? You're not going to get there. So you have to look at the property as well. Yeah. Not a 250 bucks a pop, right? No, not unless it was just replaced. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then it becomes someone else's problem, you know, 25, 30 years from now. And, uh, you know, fortunately you'll have saved the $250. All those pennies get, get put away. Way and you know you can afford the roof, but you're not gonna because you're gonna go buy something else. Um, so so all right. So I, I think I understand. You know, and you and I tend to think similarly in this fact that you know regardless of economic cycle, cash flow will you know it's wonderful in good times and it's even better in difficult times because you know that is what uh, gets you through the the winter, as they say, right? Yeah. So so in terms of your your business, uh, you know, I I I am a fundamental believer in business systems and technology. And and, you know, I I look at <laughs> I look at a business, and you know, first thing I think is process and re- procedures, and then okay, technology wise, how do we enable those processes, right, so that we can make the business as simple as possible, so that when I hire people, I don't need you know a plus 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 players. I can hire you know someone. Uh, you're talking about IQ before, you know, someone of a average to to above average IQ, and and put them in a position to succeed. So I'm curious about you know the types of systems that you tend to look at as you run your own business. 
business and, uh, and you know, how do you manage them? How are you put together? Yeah, for me, I think a lot of it is just getting good people and uh, having them nailed down so you don't have to get the A plus people. I think that's, right. that's outstanding, but just realizing when you need help. So I've got a VA doing all of the social for me so that I don't have to deal with that. Yeah. All my events, that's hugely helpful. I'm about to hire a bookkeeper because that's something that I just certainly don't have time for. Right. Even with five assets, I'm under contract on something else and there's like, there's no time left. Yeah, but it's highest so, and best use, right? Again, yes, it's highest and best use. use. And so, yeah, you've always got to uh, to be hiring and your partners can only go so far, right? So I've got someone who's great at construction and I've, I, I can, hey, I can do the accounting. I actually find it interesting to a certain point, but it's really time to, to let that go. So for me, it's just delegating and knowing when it's time to let go. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good point. And, uh, you know, how much value on an hourly basis do, you know, you as the leader of your company bring to that company, right? I, I would submit it's well above the 20 bucks an hour you're spending on a bookkeeper or less if it's offshore. And, uh, you know, time is one of those things you can never get back, right? So how are you going to spend your time? You know, that's what we were talking about for the folks out in the audience is that, uh, you know, highest and best use means at this very moment, as George and I are sitting here talking, is this the best use of his time and my time? The answer is, you know, at least in, in my from my perspective is yes, for a lot of reasons, but you know, the the fact is is that I, I am not a bookkeeper. I do not enjoy bookkeeping. Um, it is I make me I make myself do it on Friday mornings before I get to do any fun stuff so that I get it done because uh, then my accountant uh, won't yell at me. And uh, but the, but the fact is is that you know you've got to figure out you know what works for you. Yeah, well, I think that's great, Ed. I'd love to amplify that if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, it, going out on a podcast appearance, writing a book. These are the sort of things that only I can do. Yes. Delivering an interview for the foundry. I suppose someday I could hire somebody to do that for me, that'll be great. That'll show that my show has really stood the test of time. But truly these sort of things like the one-to-many marketing, where you are literally laying out what is your philosophy and attracting new investors. Those are really the only things, even deciding who can come on my podcast or what podcasts I should go on. Yep. Even that is something that I can hand off to someone else, even as just a first pass filter. Sure. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're clear on what you're looking for, right? I mean, that, and that's, you know, I was talking with uh, 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 Neil Hub Nick Huber, who was uh, on a previous show, and you know, we were talking about value chain, right? And you know, the the Tony Robbins concept, uh, where you know, there there there's communication, and then there's crystal clear communication, and it's it's okay, you know, uh, social media manager, I need you to post these three threads or these three posts at these particular times, and uh, you know, the creation but the creator budget on that is you know X dollars, and and, you know, we need to do that consistently every day, three times a day or whatever your model is. And then here's the community, the clear part. She's coming back to you saying, OK, here's what I heard. You need three posts, uh, three threads posted at these times and, you know, for this budget. And yes, I can make all that happen, uh, you know, and meet your expectations. And it's so important to be able to do that because it just it frees you up to then, you know, go do the things that only you can do. Like truly sad. Yeah. So, so George, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you've had a lot of experience and, and you, you're a, a master networker. So I know, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people in this industry, mentors, peers, whatever. And, and so, you know, this is very much a people business. I'm curious about folks that have mentored you over the years. And in, in particular, I'm curious about the, the best advice you ever got. And I, I would love to know who gave it to you. Wow. See, that's very good. I would say just going back to being trained as a scientist that the best thing you can do, if, if you're having trouble with something is just go down the hall and talk to somebody who made that sort of experiment work in the last two weeks. That is the best thing you can do. So even the most technical field, it's extraordinarily important to have that network, to know who's done what. And then when you do run into these technical difficulties, because when you're in a laboratory, you might be one of like five in the world who's right. doing this sort of research and there's you can't call tech support and you can't really yeah. Google it. Right. Uh, you, can, you can read research articles, but that may not tell you exactly what obvious thing you're doing wrong. So uh, that that I think might have been one of the early uh, on the tip of networking yeah. best advice. But I'll tell you what other people forget is that if you're new, you're networking, you're probably trying to get 25 business cards at the end of the night. It's not the most important thing. Right. Most important thing is meet one person that can help you or find one person whom you can help. Right. The deeper you go, the better you'll be. And 25 business cards will get lost in a shoebox. But that one person that you actually intend to call or who is going to call 
call you because they know that you can help solve their problem is going to be worth 10 shoe boxes. 100% agree with that. Yeah, qu- quality over quantity every time. And, uh, it, it, you know, because the thing is, is that you need, you know, really in order to kind of advance your thinking, advance the business, you need three to five uh, people who are willing to throw an arm around you and tell you the truth. That's it, right? And because it, even if that small group, all that small cadre of people don't know the answer to the question, they have their own networks that they can reach out to and find the answer within their world and then bring it back to you, right? So it's, uh, yeah, you, I couldn't agree with you more. So I, I know this is a loaded question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Leaders are readers, obviously, you know, almost to a person. And so I am always interested to, to find out, you know, first off, how do people take in information, right? You know, podcasts, physical books, audio books, YouTube videos, conferences, whatever. So I'm always interested in that. And then also I'm curious about who they're paying attention to. So those are, those are my questions. You know, how do you sharpen the saw, so to speak, and, and who are you paying attention to these days? Yeah, sharpening the saw is so important. My favorite habit, habit number seven from right. Stephen Covey. And you, you really have to make time for it though, because yeah. with the onrush of things you need to do, you got acquisitions, you got operations. Oh yeah, it's easy to get stuck. So how I'm learning at the moment depends on what else I'm doing because multitasking is key these days. So these days, what am I reading? I'm reading The Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko Willing, and this is autumn. So if I'm out exercising, I'll be listening to The Dichotomy of Leadership. If I'm in front of my computer and I'm lifting weight, then I'm watching YouTube. Right. And I'm probably going to be learning something about lending because I think most people don't really understand that. And mm-hmm. here's the thing. You can watch or listen to a thousand interviews. And I hope you listen to all of Ed's interviews because they're great. And I have watched your show before. But seriously, just watching a thousand interviews isn't going to get you any deeper. Nope. What you really need to do is you need to decide, what do I need? What is the next hurdle? So if you're looking for a loan right now, then I think every podcast you're listening to should be about lending. Yeah. And if you're having trouble with operations, then go out and find out who's overcome hurdles with occupancy or whatever issue you're facing. Right. Go deep. If you go deep, I guarantee that you'll continue to learn. You can just listen to podcasts randomly, maybe not. Um, I agree. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact is, is that, you know, one of the things that I, I admire about uh, one of my mentors and I, I said, you know, how do you think about a particular subject? And what he said was, I don't bounce across the top of, you know, topics, right? Because I, I don't want to go an inch deep. What I do is I, I target a topic and I read as many books as I can about that topic. And then, you know, I consume information about that specific topic to the point where I feel like maybe not an expert, but I, I am, you know, certainly an authority on, on figuring out uh, what that topic is all about and how I think about it. Right. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting perspective because, you know, most people that I talk with uh, bounce across, you know, bounce across the top of the, uh, the proverbial waves. Right. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to show you the rest. I feel like this is the most authentic way to do it is just show you what I'm actually reading. Gets, what was it? Get smart by Brian Tracy. I found that on Blinkist. That's a way you can do things quickly. So we live in a day and age. Yeah. Where you can learn things really quickly. Yeah. Like Blinkist is a great thing. Uh, 15 minutes, you'll understand the gist of a book, but there's nothing like a book. Get that print book. And so I also use Amazon, I forget what they call it, but that Kindle Unlimited, that's what it is. Yes. You pay like $10 a month and you can get 10 free books. And it seems like half the books on Amazon are free. Go get that book, hold it in your hands, and you can actually look at the figures. You'll learn 10 times fast. The only reason that I learn audio visual, it's because I'm doing something else at the time. If I'm focused on learning and I set the, set the, uh, the work aside, then I'm reading a book. Excellent. All right. Um, so, uh, so I'm curious, you know, given the, the very experiences professionally that you've had, you know, if you had, if you were 18 year old George again, and you had the, your life in front of you, what would you do differently in terms of, and I'm speaking specifically professionally, obviously, you know, what would you, would you, would you change the, your, your path or would you do something different? Well, yeah, obviously I wish I would have discovered investing and entrepreneurship a lot earlier, but in terms of mindset, I can tell you what I have have learned is focus. If I could go back to my prior careers and just focus more, you know, it always feels like it's such a slog that there's so many things you need to do. But if I had taken a little more time away each day and realized that you're not going to be doing whatever you're doing right now forever, whatever it is, even if you just go to this till you retire, I mean, trust me that uh, there that there is, you know, you're, you're not going to be doing this forever. Literally just a pedal to the metal. I don't know how to explain it, but when I go back and I look at my careers, just realize, look, I could have pushed a little bit harder. I, I would have survived. I could have focused a little bit more yeah. and yeah, yeah, but the, just you know, play that much harder. Yeah. You know, I'm 53 and I, 
I, I have yet to figure out what I want to do with my life when I grow up, right? You know, it's, I'm on my third career there at least. And, you know, but it's, it's not a race either, right? So, you know, everyone has their path and, and everyone uh, grows at their own pace. But, you know, the other thing though is, and it, I think it kind of dovetails on what you were saying is that the, the other, the other side of that, the other end of that really is that I have never heard of a person on there nearing their deathbed wishing, damn, I wish I worked more, right? So, you know, you might as well do something that kind of gives you that juice, like, you know, what we do for a living and, uh, and excel at that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I know I'm excited to get up in the morning. It's certainly a lot more Me fun too. to chart your course and know that wherever you are, it was because of your effort, because of your planning and because of your execution. Even when you don't like where you're at as an entrepreneur, I still think it's a lot more palatable than to feel like, you know, you're dealing with office politics or don't like the project you've been put on. All those things, I think, add unnecessary stress to your life. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, you are the sum total of all the decisions you've made and you are where you are because of those decisions. And it, it's it's never too late to, to make a change. But yeah, so so uh, George, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, you know, from a non-real estate perspective, um, when right. you are are not uh, chasing deals or, you know, uh, meeting with uh, your team, you know, how do you love to, how do you like to spend your free time? It's always great to spend time with the kids, but, you know, we all need our Shangri-La, that place you can go when uh, you just need to be away. And for me, that's solid. my sailboat. So yeah, I'm going to go uh, head out there hopefully tomorrow if Wonderful. nothing blows up or lit on fire. And I'm going to uh, to take that out, uh, give her her maiden voyage of 2023. She's the Sally Mae. And it's just a beautiful place to be. Now, I've got to do a lot of uh, electrical work. And yeah. so this is not a voyage my wife is going to come on. We've already learned our comfort zone. So look, right. if it's not 15 minutes and uh, we're underway, then she doesn't want to come. Right. And that's okay because it's less fights for both of us. Yes. I'll go out there, uh, do do the final electrical hookup, and then I'll spend a little time having fun. Yeah. Speaking of stress, right? Yeah. You want to limit that. And so uh, understand what the goal of the, of the uh, trip is so that you don't put your wife in a position where she asks questions that will not go well. <laughs> right. So, uh, hey, George, I, as always, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, thank you again. And uh, so if people want to learn more about you or Horizon Multifamily or anything else that you're doing, you know, what's the best way for them to uh, introduce themselves to you? By all means, reach out on LinkedIn. I'm always there and always will be there. And you can also find me at www.horizonmultifamily.com. That's a place where you can get a hold of my schedule and let's get to know each other, whether you are looking for deals and you think we can partner up or whether maybe you want to get in passively. Either way, happy to to talk. Well, thank you, uh, George. Uh, it's it's uh, thank you for all the wisdom and information you just provided to our audience. And uh, you know, once again, uh, I am going to make when your book when you're ready to talk about your book, you're coming back. And uh, oh, you got a deal there. Ed. I'm holding it's you been accountable. A great pleasure. All right. Well, thanks, George. Good to see you. This has been the Real Estate Underground podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, Undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.